coming, and I know the competition right now for this time slot is very high, so thank you for being here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I chose the topic of intersectionality and um, its connection to animal rights and animal protection activism. And as you probably all are aware, intersectionality has become sort of a, a buzzword. It's the sort of the, the love-hate relationship many activists and um, theorists in, in animal rights and animal activism have with, with interse intersectionality. So today I want to sort of not get into the, the heat of um, the, the, the hard debate and I don't want um, to offend anybody and um, to offend like somebody's actions. So please don't take anything personally that I say. Um, first of all, the, the aims of my talk, um, I will be talking a bit about the theory and the history of intersectionality, and um, in the second part, I want to distinguish intersectionality and pro-intersectionality, so um, commonly the two are used like people don't care, um, usually people just say intersectionality, but I want to um, go into it a little bit that there are some distinctions that might be of interest for us. And um, in the end, I want to talk a little bit about um, how we can incorporate the ideas presented in my talk um, into our activism. What I'm not going to do is tell you or anybody else what's right or wrong or good or bad in activism or in, in anything else. But I want to sort of spark discuss, discussion and um, reflection on our own um, actions and our ideas of, of activism and, and theory. So um, in the beginning of um, social justice science and um, also movements, uh, much before um, the, the current animal rights um, movement, we, we had this um, idea that we only focused on like single categories of oppressive systems. So for example, um, femi feminist theory focused most, mostly or mainly on um, the experiences of white women. And racial theory focused, for example, on black males. So the problem was, that was later pointed out by um, some people, that the experiences of some individuals falling in between of those um, categories can be expressed by either feminist theory or um, racial theory alone, and also not um, can be reflected in adding the two just um, as simply as that. So that was sort of the birth of intersectionality. Um, in 1998, um, Kimberly Crenshaw um, wrote this article um, marginalizing the intersection of race and sex. Um, where she wrote about um, the experiences of black females and how feminist theory and um, racial theory couldn't express their experiences. She used um, the term intersectionality as sort of um, a, a metaphor for streets of oppressive systems that are intersecting at certain points for example, the street of racism and the street of um, sexism intersecting at a certain point. And some groups of people are at this intersection of, of, this, um, of these oppressive systems, and um, their experiences are not just the sum of the two streets, but they are sort of interdependent on both those oppressive systems. And um, to quote from it, Intersectionality denotes various ways in which race and gender interact to shape the multiple dimensions of black women's employment experiences. So as you see, employment experiences and also only black women, it was a rather restrictive focus that Frencher worked on um, when she first introduced intersectionality. Later on, um, it was developed as sort of an analytical framework and um, social theory and also philosophy to understand the lives of black women. And it's also um, often referred to as sort of a lens or a perspective or a paradigm. So instead of like framework, if you don't like the word. And um, 
It should help us understand the differences between certain groups and um, without essentializing those specific differences. So we're not only talking about females and not only talking about black people or if you you can choose other groups or of oppressive system as well. Um, but individuals who are experiencing these oppressive systems as as a whole. Again, later on, um, other writers and researchers and also um, activists and social movements opened the concept to include more of, more of those categories. So um, intersectionality now promotes an understanding of human beings. So intersectionality is focused now, or at least at the time when this was um, introduced, was on human beings. Um, a shape for interactions of different so social locations. Um, this could be race or gender, class, age, ability or disability, or um, also religion. There are other, um, other, uh, other locations as well. And these interactions occur within a context of connected systems and structures of power. So this is another dimension that um, we need to, to consider is that these oppressive systems, they, they work within a context of, of power. It could be um, patriarchy or like the, the, the state. Um, could also be like the media, um, especially if you think about um, sexism. And through such processes, um, interdependent forms of privilege and oppression are shaped and created. And um, these, these sort of shaping um, forms are, for example, racism, then homophobia, ableism, um, or as I said, patriarchy. So this was like a very short, I really tried to, to keep this um, theoretical part really short um, in like in, in, um, in intersectionality. And um, the question now is, what do we do with it? We, we are concerned with animals and um, animal rights. What, what, what can we do with, with um, intersectionality? And um, I first want to talk about how, at least in my experience, I see how intersectionality is commonly used. And I call this the equation of oppression. And um, how I see it, intersectional theory is used to compare um, and sort of equate different forms of oppressive systems. This is, I'm not saying this is the correct way to use it, I'm just saying that in a descriptive form, that's how I see it often used within like social media or, or other forms of communication. And the, the oppressive system we are concerned with is speciesism. I think, um, and it's also uh, mentioned in, in some articles that I, I read, that at least some people base it back on Singer, um, and this is just a paraphrase, so it's not a direct quote, but he sort of said um, in Animal Liberation that racism was overcome and homophobia was over overcome, and we also battled um, sexism, and we now have sort of this equality among humans, and now it's the time to find um, speciesism. But the problem with that is that none of these um, oppressive systems have been dismantled or effectively overcome. They all still exist. We all still um, experience some forms of oppressive um, systems within our communities all over the world. And another um, problem is that um, these systems, they are not identical. So um, you all probably know this picture, and again, I'm not calling out anybody who um, made this or, or anything like that, and at least at the first sight, it sort of is persuasive, but to, at least to me, I, I get the message that racism, speciesism, and sexism are the same, and they are not. They are not the same in how um, the, the individuals oppressed are experiencing their um, oppression. They're not the same in um, the, the, the different sort of structures they make up the, the whole um, system. So 
yeah, that, that's something to keep in mind, I think. And the third problem that I see quite often is the sort of oppression Olympics, as um, Martinez calls it. And it sort of goes the way of uh, who's the most oppressed. So you probably have come, um, experienced this with talking to other people in other so social justice movements that um, you need to argue um, why it is important to consider animals because they say, well, we have uh, so many issues with human rights right now and humans are um, oppressed in a much more um, <coughs> severe way than animals and so we need to focus on, on humans first. And you also maybe have experiences the other way around with some people who say they don't care about racism, they don't care about sexism <coughs> at all, just animals first, and animals suffer the most, and they are the most oppressed of all, um, of all individuals in all of history, so um, forget about everything else right now, we need to focus on the, the most oppressed. And um, yeah, I call it a problem because I think that yeah, it's not really the, the way to use either intersectionality, and I also think that it's not theoretically um, legitimate to to compare and also to to have the sort of hierarchy of oppressed um, individuals, and it doesn't really help anybody. So this um, sort of equation of oppression, oppression is not what intersectionality was developed for. It cannot really help us with this idea of we want to compare those different kinds of oppressive, oppressive systems. So it doesn't really say a lot about that. Here's when we're sort of introduced to pro-intersectionality. At least as far as I know, um, pro-intersectionality was sort of introduced by people who worked with different or in different um, social justice movements and tried to find a way to incorporate their ideas and their experiences with um, those different systems and um, to find the, the sort of similarities between the, the different oppressive systems. And um, again, it's, it's not the same as intersectionality, and I'm going uh, into the differences a bit later. And, um, but I think it sort of tries to, to still maintain this idea that many of us share when we think about intersectionality or when we hear, hear the word, um, yeah. What it does now is it tries to, to show the connections between different forms of oppression. So for example, between sexism um, and another group of um, oppression within um, different groups of individuals. With intersectionality, we have one person, let's say it's a black woman, and excuse me that it's like this traditional um, dress shape that just had the triangular shape, so, sorry. <laughs> And um, she might experience um, racism. And she might also experience um, sexism as a black woman. And in this intersection of the two, there's some very specific um, experience, very specific form of oppression that only she, as an individual, might experience, or only um, her group of um, similar um, humans might experience. So this is sort of what intersectionality is. Pro-intersectionality now, you have two different groups of people. You have again, for my example, a black woman and um, a disabled white woman. So this thing is a walking cane, sorry. <laughs> and um, they both might share um, experiences of sexism but um, only one of them has experiences um, with racism, <coughs> while the other has experiences with ableism. So ableism, it's more of a lesser known um, form of oppression, is when um, able-bodiedness is seen as the norm, and um, people who, who are not like fall in this category of able-bodiedness um, are perceived as something less, or yeah, as being disabled in a, in a negative sense. So the two share, they might share one oppressive system, they might not, um, but there are two um, different forms of oppression that they experience, and what we are now asking is, 
do the two have anything in common? Is there anything we can say about the racism and the ableism that can inform us in any way on how to combat both of them or one of them? And when you now move on to animals and introduce them into the, the theory, I first thought about um, Carol J. Adams and the sexual politics of meat. You probably, most of you are aware um, of her work. And she argues that this mistreatment of women in society, and this is still ongoing, but has been like forever. And non-human non animals, they, they, they sort of share some similarities and maybe also a common source. So the source of this oppressive system for both women and non-human animals might be the same. And as sort of the expression of this um, oppression is the dehumanization of women in advertisement, for example, and the de-individualization of animals in the animal abuse industry or animal product industry. And as examples, you have, it's a bit like blurry, but you have um, a tiger rug with a female um, hat and I think it, re it reads, so it's an advertisement and it reads, it's nice to have a girl around the house and like a man standing on her head. There are like multiple of those um, examples and it's like really bad, so sorry, also trigger warning. Um, and a, new, a newer um, advertisement for, I think, clothes or maybe um, perfume. And it's like really um, visualizing and, and sort of, um, playing with this um, oppression of a woman and, and um, her submissiveness and like sort of rape fantasies, um, yeah. And then when you come to, to this interconnection of those two systems, then you have this, this sexualization of meat. And this is actually uh, an advertisement for a steakhouse, so it's not like some artist's photo shoot, yeah, and I think what, what Adams also argues is that this shared source for those two um, systems can be found in patriarchy, and there are other um, arguments as well, and other sources, for example, um, with the system of um, oppress oppression mainly um, with, um, with humans, um, might also be found in white supremacy. And those we, I think, need to consider when we talk about how to dismantle um, speciesism. So, why should we care? So, I mean, still, we can still go on with animal protection work and even animal rights um, activism and not consider any of what I said before. Still, most of us probably share this, the sentiment of yeah, we need to fight injustice everywhere and um, anywhere where it happens. And um, to, to do this, um, we still need to consider the specific positions other people and um, so human beings and other animals are in. You probably all know this, this hashtag, all lives matter. Um, it has not only been um, adopted by um, sort of very traditional and right-wing-ish and very right-wing people, but also within some animal um, protection and animal rights communities, um, as they say, why, why focus on um, racism and um, the lives of black people when um, we still have millions <coughs> and billions of animals suffering, so their lives matter too, so all lives matter. And of course, all lives matter, but in this specific context, you can't say, like, it's really harsh to argue in a sort of this direction and, and ignore the specific positions black people in many communities are in or women in many communities are in. And um, yeah, that's the sort of problem also many people have with some communities or some um, animal um, rights groups. And another um, objective that we all sort of probably share is that we want to dismantle the, the real the source of speciesism. 
and we now need to discuss what the source is and if it does share some um, connections to other oppressive systems and if it does then um, why not fight those at the same time it's not that like we can only do one at a time and a sort of more pragmatic uh, reason could be that to further the cause for animal um, for animal rights for animal protection we need to work with like a lot of people. We need to convince a lot of people that animals have rights or animals need our consideration. And um, the more people we can bring on board, the more likely it is for us to be successful. So um, when I start now with the from the bottom up um, with this idea of including as many people and engaging as many people as possible, it's just it's just, just very pragmatic reason for us to, to bring people together and to be stronger as a result. Now the question is how do we enlarge our numbers? And um, I found two um, different approaches. One is by Tobias, who is also here, and maybe we can ask him later if I misinterpret him or if he still sends by this. And in 2017 he published this article um, we can alienate people into joining our team. And he, in there, sort of proposes this tolerant approach where he says, don't alienate people who aren't perfect. And not only aren't perfect in the sense of veganism or animal rights, but also don't call them out if they say something racist, or don't call them out all the time if they might say something slightly sexist or something like that. So, if I interpret him correctly, he sort of says, don't uh, politicize uh, veganism, keep it to the issue that it is. In 2016, so a bit before, Christopher Sebastian McChatters um, argued in a different direction, namely, consider oppressed people, consider other oppressed groups, and call out oppression and um, sexism and racism within our own community. So if somebody says something <coughs> sexist, racist, um, ableist, call them out, even if it's online. And I mean, call out in a <coughs> nice way. You can have like discussions with everybody um, in a very civilized way and not just call them whatever. And um, so his argument is if, if we have like protests or, or actions or campaigns that are inherently racist or if we fail to, to work with groups that try to dismantle racism, we actually do alienate people in our social justice, social, social justice movements um, working on racism or sexism instead of bringing them to us to, to fight together. So you now have to sort of choose do you want to alienate this sort of mainstream, normalized um, group of people who might say something racist one, once or twice, or might, I don't know, be slightly sexist? Or do you alienate, um, do you alienate them and, and bring together, or bring together <coughs> with, with those who are on the oppressed system? So, I mean, with, within every social justice movement, you have this division of, of people, so it's, it, you have to sort of choose. And yeah, I'm, I'm not going to make decision decision for you, but it's something, again, to, to think about. Um, yeah, and another problem that I will now um, focus on is this, this idea that if we're fighting one oppression, for example, speciesism, we could, um, in our actions, in our communication, um, in our wording, be actually working on maintaining um, another form of oppression or even enforcing it. And to sort of keep this risk minimal, we should try to, to give voices to those groups of usually oppressed people um, within our community. And for example, let um, people of color let women um, and other um, people speak within our community and, and take them seriously and let their voices be heard. 
Um, now some more examples. Um, this was shared by a very large um, animal rights community on Facebook, and it's um, a white human hand and a, the hand of a chimpanzee, and it says, stop racism. Um, and I don't know if I have to sort of explain why many people were really outraged, especially within the um, anti-racism community, um, that is sort of equated um, a black body with a chimpanzee. And I know we all probably think, what's the big deal? Why is a chimpanzee something less than a black, a black um, human being? But if you consider like, the, the, the oppressive history of black people, this is just really, really offensive. Um, on a similar vein, uh, yeah, <laughs> I know, it, it's sort of probably all seen it on, on Facebook or some, um, somewhere else before. But as like somebody who might be awake within the vegan community or outside of it, this might be like really sort of, it, it's fat shaming basically. And um, for what reason? So does it mean if, if you're overweight that you're a bad person, that you can't be um, empathetic to animals? Yeah. And one that's not like really the best example, but it says um, killing is not a sport, hunters are psychopaths. And um, this idea of um, calling um, people in our opposition sick or calling them blind, calling them um, psychopaths, it sort of enforces this idea that people with mental or physical disabilities are unethical or that they <clears throat> are like more prone to being bad. And yeah, this is, this is um, something I think we really need to, to think about when we choose our words or choose um, the pictures we use for like spreading our message. And now, um, more focused, the sexism in um, animal rights activism. You probably all know the examples. One um, is Crow Pussy, and it's um, an advert to promote adoption of cats. And um, yeah, it, it's the problem with it is that it it, it helps maintain this this idea that it's fun to say something like that. That it's Sort of not serious if somebody says, well, grab a red pussy, it, it doesn't really matter. It's it's a fun way to 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 say something. Another example, and I'm not calling out pizza right now, but they have like this whole campaign with fur and with other um, other products of animals that you can wear that um, yeah, it's just naked buddies all the time. And it's not like naked bodies of normal people, but it's the naked bodies of specific people, usually very good looking models and actors and actresses, mostly also female. Yeah. And um, slightly different, you have this, I would say it, 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 there's at least a tendency in, um, in portrayals and in activism in like movies or like so, um, clips we have with our campaigns that we have female victims yeah. and male um, oppressors or um, perpetrators of, of violence. And I, I tried to find like examples where it was reverse and there are some. I mean it's not like all the time that you have the bad male and the oppressed and, and tortured woman. But still, it often is this in this case. And I also don't know, um, I, I, don't, I don't think that there's like a study um, working on this, but I would like to know the reason. Like, is there somebody like thinking um, when planning this um, activity, it would look better if the victim is a female person <coughs> and it might be more convincing if the um, perpetrator of the violence is a man, I don't know, if it is like implicit, if it is explicit, if it is free choice. Yeah, it, it's, it's at least interesting, I think. Now, there are, there are I think, various considerations we need to um, 
we need to take when we when we discuss this issue of, of sexism in in our activism. One is what if it's the female's um, own choice? So um, with our community, we had like naked protests, and we have um, female activists who really enjoy being naked in public <laughs> and working with their body for the cause. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's it sort of, who am I to, to tell them, no, you probably shouldn't do that because you're perpetuating a system that isn't so good. And so who am I to tell them how to express themselves with their body? Um, another consideration is that oftentimes, at least, I think in Europe, it's slightly different than in the US, you have um, mostly like shared um, activists with their gender. So you have equally as many male and female um, naked bodies on the street. So what do we do then? Is it still sexism? Is it still um, problematic? Is it not? Does it matter if it is a female or a male body? Um, similar to that, what roles do the, the people portray in this um, activism? Is it, is it better if um, the roles are reversed? Again, does it matter? And also, um, shouldn't we actually be working um, towards a desexualization of the female body or of nakedness? So if we always try to keep like our bodies um, closed and everything and never express ourselves with like our bodies, um, are we not also maintaining the system of try to hide yourself and that nakedness is something um, yeah, we should avoid. But then again, women can also be enforcers of sexism. Just like there are black people who are enforcers of um, racism, there are ma many women who say women shouldn't work, they should stay at home with the children, and so it goes together with this idea of their own choice. It might still be um, a maintainer of, of, uh, of sexism. Um, and sort of like on a meta level, we usually, in our activism, oftentimes not really have a lot of um, influence on how our actions, our message, our objectives are perceived and how they're used by the media. So um, I think whenever um, those sort of naked protests are done, um, it is with the objective that the media will uh, report on it because it is something <coughs> exciting, something um, not seen every day and even if we come together and discuss, well, we want to use our activism um, for the animals, but also um, to desexualize the, the, the female body and to give um, our female activists um, their own choice, the media might still distort it um, to something sexist. So we're not living in a perfect world, so that's, that's something we need to be aware of. And, um, there are some studies who suggest that this shock factor with naked bodies or um, this sexual, sexualized um, content doesn't really get us any further with um, the cause for animals. I, I, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about it because um, there are some contradictory uh, or some um, other studies who, who try to find um, other results, and I think it still needs some, some development. Yeah, I tried to really keep it short so that we can also discuss your own experiences. And what I think is important to take away was also, um, was for me, um, a sort of takeaway when I prepared this um, presentation was that within our communities, our groups, um, reflection is something that's really important. And um, even if I'm not totally, or might not totally be, be convinced of some interpretation of intersectionality or pro-intersectionality, I might still find it very important to reflect on my own position within my group, within my society, within my community, 
do I have some privileges that our people don't have and I shouldn't assume that our people have? Then um, reflection of our campaigns, of our actions, of our activism. Again, as I said um, already, we might not be aware of like a certain narrative or message within our campaign um, or wording of, of certain um, slogans. And then um, we should like sort of really listen to, to other people when they, they point out some, um, some stuff to us. Um, yeah, then we should weigh this, this um, the arguments for and against certain narratives and language use or visualizations. So I'm not saying that all naked bodies all the time are bad um, for um, fighting okay. sexism and um, animal rights. Um, abuse, but we should at least um, have like good arguments for when we are using certain troops. Um, and another point, um, again, goes together with um, reflection is evaluation. How successful were our campaigns and why? I think this has still not really been done enough, and especially within the animal rights community. And can they be like can our campaigns? be um, improved by adding intersectional and co-intersectional framing? Can it be improved by um, trying to include more people, by trying to engage um, different social justice movements? Or they might not be. So um, yeah, it's very like open for, for discussion and um, for our own, I think, experiences. Yeah, thank you.